I was about to go out into town to do a number of different things, and uh, I guess God had another plan. Ugh. Does uh, God regulate our bowel functions? Well, God is in the heart, as far as I understand the uh, scriptures, and uh, the blood flow does regulate some of the uh, more autonomic um, <coughs> um, activities of the body. So yeah, the answer is yes. God does regulate our bowel functions. <laughs> our sleep, our bowel functions, all the autonomous functions of the body. Now, we have a certain uh, free will as far as shedding is concerned because we can actually decide not to shed when we have need to and uh, we can hold it in a little bit. But in fact, if you do that a lot, you go up against God's will, literally speaking, um, you will shit your pants. And uh, I'm such a profane fella that I've done that several times in my adult life. I usually try to. <sighs> Follow God's will and shit when I need to shit. But sometimes it just shit yourself. And uh, it's never a comfortable thing to do. It's never a, a amusing thing to do. It's kind of sad to shit yourself. Yeah. Ask yourselves why we have to shit. I mean, that's a weird thing. We need to eat, right? We need to devour something so our body will be fed. But then we need to shit. We need to defecate what our, what we, from what we ate what is not good for our body. Let's say that's your temple. Let's, let's take the analogy of the body as a temple. Bodies are a temple. So, we eat. What does eating signify in the temple? What does the temple eat? Prayers. Temple is eating prayers, right? So what does the temple defecate? Eating is a prayer, right? We have to give thanks before we eat. So, if we're, a body is a temple, what does our temple defecate? What, is, what does the church defecate? Church defecates sin. In come prayers, out goes sin. Because they throw out sin from the church. Is that how it works? That makes sense. Uh, analogy speaking, you know. So what is sin? How does this sin thing come, come around to exist? Why is there such a thing called sin? <laughs> that which is sinful, that which is not sinful. I am as sinful as possible without, you know, breaking too many laws because otherwise you get arrested and put in jail and that's not fun. But I pride myself in not acting without sin. I always to slip in a little sin here and there because I'm opposed to the concept of sin. The concept of sin, that something that we do as human beings is offensive to our Creator seems to me 
ass backwards. If you create a, if you create a guitar, for instance, you tune the guitar, tune the strings. What is the sin of a guitar when you create it? Well, not playing well. You know, you getting out of tune, I suppose. But how do we know, in the case of men, what really is sinful? We don't. Because we only have to work with what we've been told, and what we've been told has been corrupted by the scribes for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Now, the Bible says, we are all born in sin. Makes sense. The guitar needs to be tuned, it can't just be left to rot on its own realm. If you make a guitar, you have to tune it. But you don't throw the guitar into the fire just because it doesn't get in tune. Or do you? Is that the um, essence of a, of a, a force that destroys its own creations because it doesn't like what they do? Gives them free will, then destroys them if they don't do what he wants. Doesn't make sense. Something there doesn't translate right. They missed something in the translation, my God. But what? How? How do you establish a relationship with your creator? That's the, the quest of a, of a sane human being. You know you are an entity that has not just come into this universe by accident, right? You know, there's something that makes sense, something that connects you to something else, and that all reality, all existence is somehow connected to something that makes it possible. So there's a creator, there's an intelligence, there's an intelligent design, if you want. How do you how do you live your life uh, and, and please that intelligent design with your life? I would have to think, and I, I may be off key here, but it, 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 it makes sense to me that if there is an entity that creates your free will, anything you do, including murder, rape, whatever, destroying cities, somehow is beautiful to your creator. Um, it sounds crazy, I know, but let me give you the extra step. Filmmaking. Make a movie, you always have a good guy and a bad guy. And if the bad guy doesn't break things up, or kill people, or, or try to rape girls, or whatever, the good guy has nothing to do. So even the bad guy can be a source of beauty for a film director, or a producer, writer, a novel, if you write a novel, you write a novel, you need an antagonist, it works, makes the novel worthwhile. Do you destroy the antagonist after you finish the novel? Usually you want the novel to end where the good guys win. But that is a simplification of human nature because the good guys and the bad guys are actually all the same guys. You know, once the stormtroopers in Star Wars take off their helmets and they go to the uh, to the catering services to have their coffee, they're just as good as Luke Skywalker and uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Very complex situation. So, let's take your classical bad guys, Adolf Hitler, Charlie Manson, Jeffrey Dahmer, right? What separates these guys from the rest of us is their ability to focus their energy to do what they want in spite of sin, law, whatever. They always take a risk when they do that because if you break the law, you generally go to jail or you get killed, right? And yet, if you don't break the law, you don't go into those realms where there's real possibility of darkness. 
How do you know? How do you know? How do you experience the totality of the beauty of God? You don't. The fortunate, Milton's fortunate fall. You know? I'm not trying to excuse all crime. That's not, that's not it. There is some of that because uh, the Marquis de Sade, who's one of my heroes, um, was in many ways called an apologist for crime. Um, so there is some of that. But what I am trying to say is that the worst crimes imaginable, murder, rape, theft, um, can have a reasonable, you know, mm, origin. Let's take rape. 90% or 95% of the people that rape women were raped themselves as children. So they were treated to some type of physical abuse or even spiritual or mental abuse by their parents. So they, I'm not saying they, they're excused of raping other people or damaging other people, but they have a a reason, a logic behind it that makes them somehow more human. Now this is accepted and, 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 um, and, and shown by the courts in many instances. So the law is made to protect the innocent, but in many cases the very fact that the law sort of like paralyzes the, um, the people from acting on common sense, it paralyzes the possibility of actually forgiving somebody for something that was maybe not so smart, that was not actually an act of evil, as in the case of many teachers that have seduced their students. It's very forbidden by the law, it's very unethical, it's not very nice, but in fact, the law punishes both the seduced person and the seducer, because they break up the relationships, they send the other one to, you know, therapy, whatever. It's easier to explain that in the drug uh, situation. You know, you, you have uh, drug consumers and drug salesmen, and somehow uh, the exploration of their consciousness is forbidden by the law because it is considered damaging or evil or whatever. And that's just wrong. So you don't, you know, you don't take it too seriously because you recognize that some teenagers, you know, smoking a joint is not as terrible as, you know, raping or murdering somebody, <laughs> or even going to jail. You know, you put a teenager in jail. You were, you, what type of harm's way are you putting that guy into? So the law is not a measure of justice. It's a measure actually of the law itself. It has nothing to do with justice. You know, the people used to burn homosexuals in some places. You just don't do that. You know, you don't go there. Because the moment you take that, that effort to burn somebody or, you know, you say you give the death penalty to somebody for, for doing something, you're causing somebody to become a murderer. And that doesn't make sense in a justice, in a justice, um, in a true justice, in the true, true sense of the word. Now, the law of the jungle out here is that, you know, you rape my daughter, I kill you. That's kind of the way it works out here, Mexico. There's a certain, uh, there's a certain uh, um, freedom in that because then not even murder is kind of punished. You know, it's everything, it's, it's all up for grabs because people don't take that much credence into law. The law is so corrupted, so fucked up, that people just say, well, there's no law, let's just do what we feel like doing and let's just get our hearts into it, you know. It's more organic, very chaotic, very dangerous, but more organic. People that actually believe in the law are usually pretty blind to its injustice. And that's where you get your Adolf Hitlers and 
that everything Adolf Hitler did was legal. Everything Benito Mussolini did was legal. Everything Churchill and Truman did was legal. You know, nuking the Japanese. Is that a is that a good thing? I don't know, I don't think so. Um, so we get back to justice and the law and, and how it why am I talking about justice and the law and taking a shit with you guys? That's a good question. I like to just taking a shit and I like to pontificate my shit. So, uh, you know, my, my, my law, I kind of like a chaotic good type of guy. I don't really believe in the law, nor do I worry too much to follow it when I don't need to. But I'm intelligent enough to follow it when I need to, so as not to get arrested or thrown in jail. And uh, I'm um, usually trying to act for the benefit of others, including myself. Chaotic good. That's my nature. Lawful good sucks. Lawful evil sucks. Doubly. <laughs> Chaotic evil kind of sucks too. You know, harming others is not my idea of a good time. Sometimes harm comes to people around you from your acts, and, and if there's no if there's no sense of um, what do you call it um, remorse in harming others, something wrong with you, there's something wrong with your soul. <laughs> you know how not to harm others. That's 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 the whole conversation. So. As we progress spiritually towards the true awakening of our spirit, our soul, whatever you call it, we search the truth. The search for the truth is an inner trip, it's not an outer trip. Here I'm holding a Dajjal in my hand, I'm talking to the Dajjal as if actually it listened. It doesn't, it just records. But even in this small effort, what I want to share with you guys, because I know somebody's watching this sometime, somebody will watch this, is my quest for truth. Not your truth, not their truth, not the great truth, my truth. My own particular, individual, boring truth. And sometimes, as I watch these videos back, I get a little hint of it, you know. Sometimes it's just bullshit. But when I get a little hint of my truth, my inner truth, I feel relieved that I spoke it into the Dajjal machine, or into the great eye, or whatever you call it, because even though Dajjal doesn't listen, or care, or understand, it just records, it just sees. Uh, I do. And uh, through this Dajjal thing, I can look at myself back, listening and trying to figure it out. And that's a good thing. So, Well, I think I'm done with my poo. I think I'm going to flush my toilet and get the fuck out of Dodge and go to the town and uh, do what I need to do. And um, I hope I don't have to poo again. I ate, some, I ate some chipotles last night in my pasta, and man, chipotle pasta it will get your asshole hot.